Genesis chapter 9. I'll read in your hearing verse 8 through 17. Genesis chapter 9 verse 8 says, Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, Understand that I am confirming my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, birds, livestock, and all wildlife of the earth that are with you, all the animals of the earth that came out of the ark. I confirm my covenant with you, that never again will all flesh be wiped out by the waters of the deluge. There will never again be a deluge to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I am making between me and you and every living creature with you. A covenant for all future generations. What generations? I have placed my bow in the clouds and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I form clouds over the earth and the bow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. Water will never again become a deluge to destroy all flesh. The bow will be in the clouds and I will look at it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh on earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have confirmed between me and all the flesh on the earth. Let's go to the back of the Bible. Revelation. Chapter 4. My favorite chapter. Revelation chapter 4. After this I looked and there in heaven was an open door. The first voice that I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit and there in heaven sat a throne. A throne was set. One was seated on the throne and the one seated looked like jasper and carnelian stone. A rainbow that looked like an emerald surrounded the throne. And the, around that throne were 24 thrones. And on the throne sat 24 elders dressed in white clothes with gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and thunder. Burning before the throne were seven fiery torches, which are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne was something like a sea of glass, similar to crystal. In the middle and around the throne were four living creatures covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf, and the third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings. They were covered with eyes around on the inside. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, 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 Lord God the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is coming. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to the one seated on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before the one seated on the throne. Worship the one who lives forever and ever, cast their crowns before the throne and say, Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things and because of your will they exist and were created. Our sermon this afternoon is entitled Lessons from the Rain. Lord, thank you for what you've done thus far. Continue to dwell with us. Bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the edges of the Aegean Sea, an old man stands there with a beard that's graying. The water's lapping at his feet as the seagulls bomb back and forth. And he has been exiled there among the rocks and the cliffs and the salty ocean all by him lonesome. John the Revelator has been placed there so that he can no longer cause trouble amongst the Roman Empire. John, this beloved disciple, the sole survivor out of disciples now, of the original and chosen ones is imprisoned on Patmos. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 1 verse 10 through 11, it says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice, a trumpet saying, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. And so John writes what he saw and he writes that letter and he sends it out to the churches and you can read it for yourself in the first chapter. The last time he had seen the Savior, you see, he was riding on the back of a cloud back to heaven. He was riding there with an escort of two angels. Now here he is, clothed with a garment of heavenly brightness, and his head and hairs are bright and snowy like wool. His eyes are like flames of fire. The Bible goes on to say, his feet gleamed like polished brass, polished to a high sheen, and his voice sounded like Niagara Falls. 
Jesus then proceeds to dictate to John these seven letters, and John wrote them, and he delivered them. And then the Bible goes on to tell us in Revelation chapter 4, After this I looked, and there was a door opened up. And the voice says, Hey, I've got something to show you. This is my favorite chapter in the Bible because it seeks to encapsulate all of God's marvelous wonder. It seeks to give us a taste of what heaven is going to be like and how we should be doing things in worship down here. What do you say? Now, I can't imagine how those folks who were listening to this letter as they received it back then, because, you know, the Bible wasn't written just for our personal enjoyment. It was written to fix situations. It was written to solve some issues that were going on to those who were listening back then. So I can see these people's faces as they're listening to this letter read from this guy who's across the ocean by himself amongst the rocks. They're like, what are you talking about? Do you hear what he is saying and describing about this person who is seated on the throne? Many of these individuals are being persecuted because they didn't worship like everybody else. They're being persecuted because that emperor back then, Domitian, he was a real cutthroat individual, and he wanted everybody to worship him. And so he sought to force that thing, but they stayed faithful. And so John sends them this letter to encourage them to do not lose faith, but look up and look forward to the future for a better tomorrow. Describing somebody who was so great and amazing that it can elevate them out of the temporary situation. That time period was just like nowadays, filled with reality TV shows, with the uh, Colosseum, with the gladiators going back and forth, chopping each other down. It was filled with all types of uh, liberal sexual uh, engagements. It was filled with all manner of things that was afflicting the individuals who were trying to be like Jesus, but struggling with it since everybody else around them was doing everything else opposite to Jesus' way tells us immediately he was in the spirit and there in heaven a throne was sat and it says one was seated on the throne and the one seated on the throne was like jasper he looked like jasper and carnelian stone that's the first thing we see you see the jewish people they did not believe in describing and naming that person who was on the throne and so they sought to describe the amazing features that were around him he says it looked like carnelian stone it looked like jasper and i tried to find what jasper looked like jasper is a stone that's uh, kind of yellowish and it's supposed to be clear but every picture that i found didn't look too clear and so clearly this thing is very rare and so if you're in here taking notes this evening or this afternoon and you want something to walk home with, the first thing you need to know is that we need to stop dumbing the Lord down. What that simply means is he's a lot better than your greatest accolades you could ever give to him. And therefore, you need to probably stress yourself out a little bit more and go to the thesaurus and figure out how you can give him some compliments, especially after he's delivered you from some things. You see, John the Revelator knew exactly what the situation was. He knew that he didn't have to be alive in isolation by himself and that he was blessed to be right there and receiving a word from the Lord in person from the master himself. We've got to stop dumbing God down because in doing that we are elevating everything else on this sinfully dreadful place if we want people to be impressed if we want people to desire to know more about the one who we claim to serve then we've got to be anxious we've got to be upbeat about it whenever we're talking about him we can't just say oh the Lord's been good to me he paid my rent I really don't want to be a part of that situation. We can't just say, man, I'm so glad that God woke me up this morning while we're still rolling through tired and dragging. That's not a situation that I want to be around. I do not want to have that type of relationship with that guy who's supposedly blessing and taking care of you. We've got to stop dumbing him down because whenever we turn on the TV, they have such great accolades for everybody else in the world, but yet we can't do nothing for the master. You see, God's amazing. And John told us now, the one that sat on the throne looked like Jasper and Carnelian stone. He was seated there. Now we're talking about lessons from the rain. 
The Bible goes on to say, what's my favorite picture in the Bible? It says that there was a rainbow that looked like an emerald that surrounded the throne. And around that throne were 24 thrones, and on the 24 thrones, elders were seated in all white with golden crowns on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and thunder. Now, let's talk about rain. Strange title, huh? We ain't even have any rain in heaven, but we have the after effects of rain. We have the byproduct of rain, and that only came to be because God instituted and set here for us a promise when he wiped out the earth with water. And he flooded the place we just read in Genesis that God promised Noah and his people that he would never destroy that earth again by the flood. And what did he put up in heaven? A rainbow, but that rainbow was only 50%. You see, this rainbow now in heaven is going all the way around the throne. The apostle Paul writes, now we see through a glass darkly, but yet when I get to heaven, I'm going to be able to see the full picture. You see, we only have half of the promise here on earth. God said he wouldn't destroy this place by water again. And so we're banking that. We're taking it to the bank all the time whenever it rains, and we're thankful. But that promise is all also something fully realized up in heaven because that promise lets us know that he loves us that he sent his son for us and that grace binds up all of his judgments and what he's doing for us here now now it's a funny thing when we're driving in our cars we're looking through windows that are really tinted right some of us like to have the uh, little secret society thing. Some of us want to look gangster and have our tent on the limo tent so that whenever we try and reverse, we got to lower the window down and stick our head out to look where we're going. But now look at this picture. Now, when we're in the cars, it's filtering out light, right? It's filtering what we're seeing on the outside. And so imagine this emerald tinted rainbow up in heaven around the one seated on the throne. And that rainbow is symbolic of a what? A promise. The rainbow is symbolic of what? A covenant. The rainbow is symbolic of how much he loves us and the grace that he has for us. And so every time he's looking out towards us on the earth, what's he looking through? A promise. What's he looking through? A covenant. What's he looking through? Something that he set up to remind us and himself about how much he loves us and what he's going to do for us. Lessons from the rain. Now, I had the opportunity to work on my gardener's thumb. What do they call that thing? A green thumb? Yeah, a green thumb. And so I found myself getting me some plants from Lowe's. I had some tomato bushes. I got me some green bell pepper bushes, and I put them out in the backyard. I didn't put them in the ground. I got a milk crate, put them in that. I don't like weed and stuff. So that they're growing. And so as I'm learning as we go along, I'm faithfully going out there now watering my plants every day. Then I realized after I did my research, there's such a thing as too much water for plants. And so I said, okay, then let me, let me draw, hold back on this. Doing every other day. And then so I go away and I realized that there was a big time rainstorm when I was out of town. And I come back and my plants all of a sudden have exploded in growth. And I'm like, what is this? So last week I'm there. And so, so I, I, I took that to heart and I took some notes. And so I went online and some people were talking about, you know, you need to collect the rainwater because it's free water. You don't got to pay for it. And that rainwater is a lot better than city water. Why? Because city water, man put his hand on that stuff. You see, city water, man got involved in the situation, tried to soften it, add some fluoride to it for folks of us who are not faithful in brushing them teeth. Oh, my goodness. And so when man gets a hold of that city water now, when he adds stuff to it, it disturbs God's plan for growth in his nature. And so we're talking about lessons from the rain. So I'm learning something now while I'm watching these plants grow while I'm watering them daily. I'm watering with the city water. They ain't doing too good. But as soon as I stop that and the Lord rains down rain from heaven, all of a sudden these things explode. And I'm like, man, Lord, in addition to the promise in the sky of the rainbow, there's something to this rain. And so I'm thinking this thing through. So what I do is I go out and I buy me some 55 gallon drums them big old blue things from Coca-Cola. Still had the syrup in there. I can smell Pepsi. I can smell Coke all in my backyard. And so I put a bucket on top of that thing. I put the funnel there. And I put it under the spot where all the water overwhelms my gutters and falls right into that barrel. 
So the rain's coming down real hard. And I put my barrel over there. I'm catching the rain. And so I'm like, oh, man, you know what? That's what's up. I have some empty buckets in the back. So I put them buckets out there. I'm catching. Man, my buckets are strategically every day. Over everywhere, it's catching all the rain that it can. And so now I'm catching the rain. The rains come down. And so last week, it's raining real hard down there. And my, I'm collecting my rainwater now because I have learned that when man's water gets in my plants, they don't do so good. But when God's water comes down and waters my stuff, all of a sudden, strange and marvelous things happen. And so after the rain, the rainbow came out. I said, Lord, thank you for the promise. And so now I'm looking at the rain. And then I said, oh, my goodness, look at what I've learned. The Holy Spirit said to me, Micah, what do you have to do with the plant's growth? I said, nothing. He said, Micah, what do you have to do in the facilitation of me absorbing water from the earth and cleansing it from where you and your people messed it all up? And then I store it up in the clouds for my plants and vegetation to return it to them just when they need it. What do you have to do with it? I said, nothing. He said, so why don't you just ask for me to provide for you like I'm providing for my plants? And so I said, okay, I received that. And so the rain is coming down. Now the rainbow's up there and I'm realizing, man, Lord, that's a marvelous thing. I didn't even realize it. You see, we are living our lives in such a manner that there is a constant and precipitation of blessings being stored up for us in heaven now you don't understand it do you know every day God is storing up blessings for us in heaven don't you know that whenever blessings meet critical mass just like rain reaches a critical mass up there in those clouds all of a sudden the clouds doing some strange thing the bible paints a picture in revelation chapter 4 about some thunder and lightning that's coming from the throne sands raindrops he paints a picture that there's strange voices grumbling in the throne talking about the glory and the goodness of god i can't understand them neither can john but they're without the rain why there's no need for rain in heaven when the originator of all the blessings is up there take taking care of everything and so all the time blessings are going up God is storing them for us and then right when we need them he is letting them fall for us somebody told me that Malachi has something to say that test and see that the Lord is good and he will what open up all the windows of so I'm looking out of my backyard I'm like man Lord I don't got enough buckets and so I'm looking now I'm watering my plants and they're growing amazingly well but I are growing well because I am using water that God provided. God said to me, Micah, you're just like a plant. You need my constant attention. You need my rain that I can rain down for you. You need to be filled with my Holy Spirit. You need to understand that when I'm looking at you, that I'm seated in the midst of an emerald green rainbow that's symbolic of the promise and the the covenant that I have for you and your people and so I will never forsake you because I promised it God can't go against his word he can never fail himself because he's God never changing third point third point if you want to write notes it's not about us all about him so get out the way and just worship the Bible goes on to tell us that the 24 elders now who seated around the throne dressed in crispy white you see they weren't beholden to earthly fashion rules they were in white before Easter. They were in white after labor. They were in white all year long. You ladies know what I'm talking about. And what did they do in those white robes? You see, the Bible tells me that whenever those living creatures rolled around with their faces everywhere and all the wings on the inside, you see, the Bible tells me that they covered their faces with two wings, covered their feet with two wings, and then flew around the rest of the place crying out, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who's coming. Whenever they did that, the Bible tells me that those 24 elders fell down before the one seated on the throne and they cast their crowns oh my goodness they said our Lord and God you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things and because of your will we exist because of your will I exist because of what God has done for us and how much he loves us. He is in control and he will always be blessing and taking care of us. Get out of the way. 
Worship how God wants you to respond. Remember that he loves you and that he will always guide you and rebuke you and correct you from the center of a throne that's surrounded by an emerald green rainbow symbolic of his promise that is fully realized up in heaven. We only see half of the thing down here that he's not going to wipe the place out with water. But in heaven, it's going all the way around. I want to go. I hope you want to go. The only way we're going to get there is if we take some cues from these guys or ladies, who knows. But they put first things first. They made sure they glorified the Lord in all that they did. The creatures, they did their jobs faithfully. The elders did their jobs faithfully, and so we should do the same thing. In our daily walk, let's not dumb the Lord down so that we can get others to imagine his greatness. Just lift his name up in the best way you can. Yes. Yes. Let's remember that even when we're going through hard spots like they were back then, that God is in heaven seated and filtering how he's looking at us through a promise that he set up for us. And that when it comes time for us to worship, forget about what everybody else is doing, what everybody else is saying about how it should sound, about how it should look like, what it should feel like, and what we should be using. Because I'm seeing people in this full body worship, falling prostrate on the floor. I'm hearing clanging of cymbals in heaven because of those many different crowns clanking across the floor. Now, you might not be able to see them if you're up there, but you've got to move from behind the thrones where those guys are and watch them on the floor. It's difficult to catch them prostrate because they keep catching themselves back up and redoing it over and over again. But I'm so thankful that one day God is going to step out of heaven. He's going to break the barriers of that emerald rainbow and he's going to come back here for you and me. How do I know it because Revelation goes on to tell me that the one who's seated on the throne is going to stand up and there's going to be a rainbow seated on top of his head, not around the throne. It's following him, the promiser, the covenant keeper, the covenant maker, and he's coming back for you and me. Do you want to be ready? I suggest you stand up. Is there anyone here today who has not made that decision to follow the Lord? I suggest you decide right now and come on down. You see, there's going to be a strange thing that happens up there when the Lord stands up and he begins to come back on a cloud, sands the rain. Something strange is happening that there's going to be silence in heaven. There's not going to be any more thundering and lightning flashing. There's not going to be any more elders falling and sliding across the floor. No more clinking of the crowns. No more holy, 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 because everybody's going to be gone. We're going to be standing somewhere in the world, looking at a cloud coming back, starting off real small, and then we're going to see Jesus himself. Paul encourages it that those of us who are going to go to sleep in advance, that he's going to call us by our government name. He's going to say that whole thing, get up. When we're resurrected, we'll be transformed in the twinkling of an eye. And those of us that remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord. I want to be there. I already know what I need the Lord to get for me. I need some wings on my back so that when I go flying throughout the galaxies, I can dive, bomb, and fly with the best of them come and go as I see fit. I want to be there. I've got a place behind the throne that I intend to be there. Do you want to be there? Twelve gates. I could be first. I can be last. I can barely get in. I don't care as long as I'm there with my family. Do you want to go? If you have not decided, come on down. If you haven't decided, come on down. Lord, you see your people. They showed up today on the lay that you blessed. They showed up today, Lord, because they know and they love you and they're here to worship you, to get rebooted for the journey. Preserve us and keep us, Lord. Help us to be faithful ready so that we can meet you in the sky.
Those of us, Lord, who have not decided to follow you but are still dragging our feet, don't get up just yet. Stay in the midst of the rainbow a while longer. Continue to look at us through grace and love. Give us another chance to get it right. Save us, Lord. Save us from ourselves. In Jesus Christ's name, let everybody say amen. Amen. amen.